thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, it's going to be on airflow and workflows. Um, but first, just a few words about me. I'm uh, Michał Kraszyński. I work with Python, but also with JavaScript and with Linux. I also write a blog, which some of you may know. And I'm currently a tech lead at Intel and also a consultant at uh, a company called Eftaria. All right, so let's talk about workflows. How many of you know what I mean when I say workflow? Raise your hands. OK, that's like four people in the room. So it's a very vague term, but it's a popular word also. So it can be very confusing when I'm just saying that I'm going to talk about workflows. So I'm going to define them a little bit to narrow down what I mean. When I'm talking about workflows, I mean that we have a sequence of tasks that are started on some schedule or maybe triggered by an event happening somewhere. And these will carry out some work for us. This is frequently used with data processing pipelines uh, and other jobs in the big data field. The, a typical workflow would, could look something like this. I get some data from some data source that came in, and I'm downloading it for, for processing. Then I'm sending it off for processing on, uh, on a system somewhere else. Then I have to monitor whether the processing was completed successfully and if it's done. And when it is done, I get the results of the processing back. I generate a report, and I send this report out by email to, to some people. So that's a very typical workflow example. But <coughs> this workflow uh, methodology is so generic that there are examples almost everywhere. So many types of ETL uh, workflows uh, could be uh, defined. Data warehousing is also a place where you would uh, use a workflow. You could use a workflow when you're doing A-B testing to handle uh, some of the automatic steps for you. Uh, anomaly detection is another area where workflows are used. Training recommender systems that were just presented in the previous talk are uh, probably uh, using some workflow system uh, to, to get this job done. Um, orchestrating automated testing. This is actually what we are using Airflow for in, at Intel. So that's why I marked it there. And another example from bioinformatics field, you could be processing some genome every time a new genome file uh, is published somewhere. So all of these jobs could be handled by, uh, by a workflow. Because of this, a whole slew of new uh, workflow managers has started to come up in recent years. And there's these, which are listed on the screen, these five, are just a small subset of all of the ones that are available. And these are the mo more well-known ones. But I will be speaking today about Airflow. Uh, and Airflow, or Apache Airflow, is an open source project. It's written entirely in Python using uh, some well-known Python open source uh, technologies itself. So it's based on Flask and uses Celery. Um, it was originally developed by Airbnb, but it's grown very quickly and uh, extensively over the last couple of years. So it currently has almost 300 contributors, 4,000 commits, and many, many stars on GitHub. And it's used by hundreds of companies. We're using it at Intel. I guess Airbnb uses it. And Yahoo, PayPal, and many others uh, are using it also. Um, a pad, uh, the Airflow provides you with three things. It provides you with a framework for writing your own workflows. It provides a scheduler and quite a scalable executor for running the workflow tasks. And it also provides a web UI for monitoring the uh, workflows as they are running and for viewing logs. So in this talk, I will focus primarily on this first point, on the framework, which you can use in Airflow to define your own workflows and tasks. Um, I will, won't be speaking very much about the executor or the, or the scheduler, but there already was a talk on that this morning, a good talk by Fr uh, Federico Mariani, who uh, was speaking about Airflow also. So if you missed that one, I'm, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube later. All right, so 
before I begin showing you code examples and other things, I will take a minute to show you Airflow itself, um, give you a demo. So when you uh, set it up and uh, run Airflow on your computer, you will get this web uh, interface to it. So it lists and, uh, all the workflows you have, de you have defined in that table. And uh, if you click on this little play symbol right there, you will be able to start a workflow manually just like that. And then you can go in and take a look at your workflow. This one is called Hello World. And you will see that it's currently being executed. It's running. This task already managed to complete. This task is uh, going to be scheduled in a second. And uh, you can see a whole, you, the whole history of uh, your, work, your workflows runs. And uh, for each of them, uh, you get, for each task, you get uh, an entry in this table. You can click on it and view the logs uh, of, a particular, uh, of a particular task. If any errors occurred, the, the logs would be here. Um, you can click on the graph view, and then you will see the, uh, another view of the, same, uh, of the same workflow from which you can also view its logs. So my hello world uh, example returns hello world, so it works. So that's, that's the UI. And uh, it's actually very easy to get to this point. Um, installing Airflow and setting it up is quite easy. Um, but I will be talking more about the code needed um, to write workflows in a second. But before I do that, um, I want to talk about what actually flows in a workflow. Why is a workflow actually called a workflow? So <coughs> uh, every task that we have uh, in our workflow makes decisions. And those decisions are based on the input to the workflow that was to the workflow run that was started, and also the output of uh, upstream tasks. So all information flows from downstream to, uh, from, from upstream to downstream. So, so it's kind of like a river. And I want you to think of a river for a minute. Like a river, uh, a workflow starts, begins somewhere. So it has a source. It may have many tributaries. Uh, which join together to form this river. Um, it also ends up somewhere, like a river flowing down into the sea, or it can form uh, many final branches, like a li like river delta. What a uh, workflow also, also does is it can have branches. So, okay, this is where the analogy breaks down a little bit, because rivers don't usually do that. Um, but workflows do. They can have very many branches which can split up from the main branch of the logic of the workflow and then join back together to form the final workflow result. So this isn't really a river, it's a, it's a graph. It's a directed acyclic graph so where the information always fr flows from upstream to downstream. And you can actually use that very creatively when you're designing your workflow. Because if you put some information into your, uh, into your workflow at any point, uh, it's like putting a message in a bottle into the river at some point. It will flow down and pass every point. Well, I guess you would have to put many bottles into the river if you wanted it to reach every point. But the point is you can put information upstream, and it will flow downstream. So if I put some information at point B, it will be available to all points in the graph downstream of that. If I put some information in point D, the same thing ha happens. And then finally, uh, at this end point where all the branches combine, I get all the information and I can generate my report or do whatever I need to do with all this information. So when you're, generate, when you're writing your workflows with this in mind, you can uh, make them quite modular and uh, make them use information from, uh, from sources upstream in uh, the tasks that are running after that. OK, so that's, uh, so that's enough about rivers and about, uh, and about the magic of the graphs. Let's get to Airflow and how, workflow, how Airflow works with this. So 
Airflow uses the concept of uh, the directed acyclic graph for uh, all workflow definitions. And that allows you to define the logic of your workflow as the shape of, of the graph. And this is very easily done. This is, the, this is actually a complete uh, code example of the Hello World workflow that I was showing at the, at the beginning, aside from missing some import statements. Um, so I'm going to walk you through these couple of lines, but it's very simple. So first of all, there's some Python function that I want the workflow to execute. This one just returns Hello World. And uh, then I define uh, the DAG just by uh, specifying a couple of uh, parameters. Uh, and using that DAG as a context manager, I define a couple of tasks by uh, instantiating these operators. So first one is called dummy operator, second one is called Python operator. But these, these create tasks. And in order to combine these tasks into a graph, I can use this uh, bit shift operator that was overridden to allow joining tasks together. So this method of defining graphs is very quick and easy. And if you, when you get used to it, you, it allows you to create uh, graphs as complex as you need. And moreover, since this is being defined in Python code, you can use any looping logic that, the, uh, that you want to define more complex uh, more complex graphs. Um, the next Airflow concept I want to uh, talk about is the operator. This is the, the way you define uh, the actions of a single task. An operator is essentially a Python class with an execute method. And that, that's all you have to create to have a very robust uh, a very robust entry in your graph and in your workflow, because this will automatically be retried, and uh, if it fails, it, it can be repeated until, until it succeeds. And therefore, each of these functions should be endempotent so that if it runs multiple times, it won't have unintended consequences. But um, an example is just this simple. In fact, I made this uh, slightly more complex than it needs to be, because all it needs to be is a class with the execute method. But I added this one parameter up there to show you that you can also parameterize your, your tasks by, uh, in, in the uh, definition of the DAG when you're, when you're putting them in the, final, in the final DAG by passing uh, parameters uh, through, um, through the init, init function. Another concept Airflow uses is called sensor. And sensors are uh, long-running tasks. It's, this is very useful for monitoring purposes. So if you have, a ta if you have some uh, data processing job running somewhere, you may want to check on it periodically to see if it finished. And uh, Airflow gives you the ability to do this very simply if you define a sensor class with a poke method. The poke method will be called repeatedly until it returns true. So a very simple example is this one. I have a, a sensor with a, with a poke method, and this one, uh, this example is slightly silly, but it just checks if the current time, the minute, uh, is divisible by three. And if it's not, it returns false, which means that the method will be called again after a, a, a certain number of time, I think it's one minute by default. And uh, it, until it returns true, it will be called again and again. And then finally, when we reach the point where the current minute is divisible by three, we will return true and uh, the sensor will exit. Another very important concept in Airflow is uh, XCOM or CrossCOM. It's a means of communicating between tasks. Uh, and th this is just uh, actually uh, a way to save things in a database, a s simple way to save things in the database and then retrieve them later. So because these things, this mes these messages that you pass are saved in the database as pickled objects, it's best suited for small pieces of data like object IDs rather than whole objects, but it works very well when you use it this way. So it's very easy to use. 
in your operator, in your task, uh, in the execute function, you have a, a parameter called context. And if you just uh, retrieve the task instance, the, the running tasks instance from this uh, running e execution context, you can uh, call the xcom push function uh, to pass some information into, uh, into Crosscom. And then in another task downstream of, uh, of that one, you can call xcom pull to retrieve this information and use it later. Um, you can also do a trick for scanning all upstream uh, tasks um, by using uh, something like this code example, which has these three lines uh, in, in the middle here, where I'm getting all the upstream tasks from, um, from the graph, and then I'm uh, calling xcom pull on all of the IDs of the upstream tasks and querying the, all the upstream tasks for a, specific, um, for a specific piece of information, and I get an array of all the, uh, of all the defined database IDs in this case, for example. Um, what you can do when you're uh, defining your uh, workflows with Airflow is actually create reusable operators. And this is what makes uh, Airflow workflows very modular. Because if you use um, loosely coupled functions as your operator functions, uh, meaning that you have only very few necessary parameters um, passed in by XCOM. And most other parameters are optional and have same defaults. Then you can put an operator like that, a task like that, in very many different types of workflows. So <coughs> in this example, I have a, I have a pink uh, operator called Nexus, which can be something that collects information from a lot of, uh, a lot of upstream tasks and uh, combines it somehow. But it can also be used in a different place, in a different graph, uh, where it doesn't have all the same information coming from upstream, but it knows how to behave well in that context as well. And it plays a slightly different role in another workflow. So this proved uh, to be a very powerful technique uh, for us when we're doing uh, our test, or uh, test orchestration using Airflow because we're defining like blocks uh, of, uh, of code which fit in many different places and, uh, and, are ab and we're able to combine them into very many different workflows by reusing the same components in different contexts. So if you, uh, if you pay attention to these details, you, you would be able to do the same thing. Um, so let's look back at the typical workflow that we started with. The tasks that uh, are part of the workflow are defined in Airflow through the operators. The one that's used for monitoring the processing is a long-running sensor, and all information that passes from upstream to downstream uh, tasks goes through this Crosscom uh, functionality. Okay. There, is some, there are some more interesting uh, things that you can do also. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, follow a certain branch of the graph and skip others, you can use uh, an operator called the branch operator, or the, the branch Python operator. So that's a very simple example up there. You have a graph with, um, three, uh, with three tasks, one upstream and two downstream, and then the upstream task, the branching task, decides which task to follow simply by returning the, the ID of the, the task downstream that needs to be executed. All others will be skipped. Another way to skip tasks and, and, and therefore maybe skip entire branches of your workflow that you don't want to execute is by uh, using a special kind of um, uh, Airflow exception called the Airflow skip exception. And this exception uh, will force this particular task to be skipped, whereas all other types of exceptions, if they're not caught, 
will cause the task to be retried. And if the uh, retry doesn't ultimately work out, then they will fail. So this skip exception uh, is like putting a dam in the river. You're stopping the flow of, uh, of the workflow downstream. But you can actually control whether you're really stopping or uh, the uh, execution by uh, deciding what trigger rule your um, tasks, uh, your particular task has. So by default, uh, all tasks require, uh, all upstream tasks to be uh, successful, but uh, you can change that to uh, a different, one of, one of the options listed up there, uh, and the one that I find particularly useful is uh, all done, which means that whether a task uh, succeeded or failed, your downstream task will execute. And if you write your operators in such a way that they know how to behave even when the upstream failed or was skipped, then um, you, you can continue the execution through, uh, through your workflow going downstream. So uh, all done. Is like opening the dam for <laughs> from downstream uh, of task. Um, you can do a lot of other very useful things with uh, Airflow that I'm not going to uh, get into the details of. But for example, you can run bash commands um, as your as your tasks. So in order to execute bash commands on a worker, you can use the um, the bash uh, operator. Uh, which allows you to uh, pass in a bash script, which is actually wrapped in a Jinja template. So you're actually running a bash script generated by a Jinja template. I guess an example is um, uh, worth more than uh, a lot of words. You can uh, put a template uh, into the bash operator, and uh, this will be uh, first executed, and then the bash command uh, will be will be executed on, on the worker. So um, Airflow also allows you to, 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 to write a lot of plugins to extend it. So uh, writing plugins is also very simple. You just um, create a subclass of, uh, of Airflow plugin and put it in a plugins directory. And then you can, put, you can define a whole list of things that Airflow uses um, and make them available to your instance of, uh, of Airflow. So operators, we already talked about, but you can also define menu links for the web uh, interface that I was showing at the beginning. You can create whole admin views because it's based on um, Flask admin. So you can, you can add, create additional views uh, in the admi administrative interface, or even entire Flask blueprints that you can plug in uh, and it's actually very extendable, so I'm sure it will be useful for many cases that you may have. All right, that's it from me. And there's a tutorial available on my blog, so if you want to get started quickly uh, with trying Airflow, you go there, and thank you very much. Thank you, Michal. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. So um, I wanted to ask, how does Airflow integrate with distributed systems? So if you want to distribute your process, for example, you run some method and you actually want to um, distribute it over multiple servers, how can you then, because you trigger like an execution of that process with Airflow, so how can you then decide that it, for example, not runs on your local machine, but then on a different server somewhere else? So um, the... The underlying technology that we're using for distributing work along different workers is Celery, and Celery gives you a lot of control over where things get, uh, get executed, so that would be one way. Um, other than that, I guess it would be more manual than, than, than automatic. But um, we didn't actually have to uh, make these decisions because all our workers are capable of running the same set of tasks, so um, not going to give you a definitive answer, but Celery is under there, so so going that way would work. Hi, um, I have uh, two questions actually. The first one is like, is it 
uh, resilient. Is it like, uh, do you use it in production at the moment? Yes. Okay, and do you have any use case uh, for sensors? Yes, 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 we do, because we are actually, uh, like I mentioned, we're using it for orchestrating uh, automatic, uh, automatic testing, and these tests can run for a long time. So we're uh, actually checking on the executors, which are uh, not the same as our airflow workers. Our airflow workers are just the ones who trigger the tests, but we're checking on the executors if they're finished uh, running all the tests. And uh, when they're done, then, uh, then we can make some decisions about what, what to do next. And sensors work in that context quite well. Uh, a great talk, uh, thanks for that. Um, two questions I have is, do you run Airflow in more than one node? And the other question is, have you seen Airflow being used to tasks that require manual input? Yeah, I'm not sure I, uh, I heard you correctly. Uh, could you? Okay, continue? so yeah, the first question was, um, do you run Airflow in more than one node? Like, can it handle the workflow being run in more than one uh, component model, than one node, more than one server? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, have you seen or have you ever have the experience of running Airflow for tasks that require manual input, some user input? Okay, okay, okay. So first question uh, actually uh, has a good answer because uh, we are running um, um, a, a triplicate of, uh, of servers. So we have um, three web interface hosts, three, uh, three worker hosts, three schedulers. And without actually having to do very much, w Airflow was uh, able to behave very well in this context. So it was running uh, in parallel on three different servers all three uh, services were running together and they are able to exchange information. So when I click to view logs on, uh, on the web interface, it's able to pull the logs from the correct worker. It knows where the, where, where the logs are. So it, it's able to uh, work on multiple uh, nodes like that very well. In terms of manual input, to do that, we had to use, we had to create um, an API that has uh, that, that that will have a, a user interface, uh, but through that API, we're actually calling Airflow's uh, uh, methods for starting some some workflows with additional input from users. That is not something that comes out of the box, but we were able to extend it by adding some API methods to the administrative side. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, one question that would be very useful for a project of mine is, um, can you actually group the operators and reuse the groups? Um, when you say you want to group them, do you mean you want to group them uh, logically, like in a class hierarchy, or group them into, uh, into smaller workflows? Now, for example, if I always use the same five operators in the same configuration, Mm -hmm. then can I put them into one overreaching operator somehow? So there is, there is an operator type that I haven't experimented with and uh, I'm not sure how well it works, but it's there for this purpose. It's called a sub-DAG operator. So you create like a, like a, a DAG with a bunch of operators, a, a graph of, of the five operators you, you, like you were talking about, and then you use that as an operator itself. So you kind of put the whole uh, graph into another graph. But I haven't used that, so I'm not sure how, how well it works. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Michal. Please give another round of applause to Michal.